Just ignore that stuff on the bottom. Uh, I'm hosting the meeting. This is our first, I am so honored, first of all, to be here. Uh, Tom and I uh, appreciate it when we get invited. And I have, I have promised myself, I've got to say, okay, I got it. It's okay to record me. I hope I don't say anything I regret. Um, hang on. There we go. Uh, and this is the first, we understand the first hybrid meeting where we have people in the room and somewhere else. So welcome all you people that are online and it's wonderful to be with you in person. The cookies are better here. <laughs> okay, so, you know, uh, and it's lovely to be able to do that now. So thank you very much. It's an honor. I've done one other one that was a hybrid meeting and it worked out okay. So I'm hoping that this one will too. Okay, and uh, Tom is, um, we've been together for 55 years in marriage. And about eight years before that, we met in junior high. He and I, we are Velcro. We are a team. And whatever we do, we do together as much as possible. So I don't want to sell that man short. And he carries all the heavy objects, drives the car, and does all that in addition to all the other things that I get him into. Another nice mess, OK? So um, uh, tonight, we're going to talk about native plants and native birds, a relationship worth nurturing. Because it's an easy relationship to nurture. And the rewards are very great. Now, I am not a native plant. Any, I'm not. I'm a member of Nipsod Alamo chapter. Okay, uh, and there can we work in partnership because it's a wonderful native uh, natural partnership. But I'm no expert. I heard an ex was a was a has been and a spurt was a drip out of pressure under pressure, and I don't think I am. But um, I understand how important it is to integrate all the many things that we can do for our environment. We can't just do plants. We can't just do birds. We can't just do, it all fits together. I used to teach biology. I said, if you don't learn anything else this, this year is remember, it all connects. And if you pull one string, it makes, uh, it makes an effect other places. So I'm not here, of, you know, somebody says, well, you're gonna go preach, preach to the choir. I said, well, you know, the choir needs to be preached to sometime because you need to know you're doing the right thing and you need to go out and tell other people yeah sure thank you i will i was just reminded and i should have said this before but i was so excited um we are going to have questions at the end until they run us out of here uh, i should be done before that but if you do have questions if you put them in the chat and if you have questions out here put them on a piece of paper or whatever, and we'll get to them at the end because I want to try to get through the program, show you all the pretty pictures. And uh, if you have questions or comments, I learn a lot from listening to people that I speak to. So we'll go ahead with that. Thank you, Dick. Okay, so um, plants and birds have grown up together here in the Texas Hill Country. You know, and I went to a symposium the last two days about Texas and this changing environment. And it was very, I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna come out there and I'm gonna to wanna to sit in a hot tub and open a vein. It's gonna be such a, it's gonna be such a downer. It was not. We have so many people in our state that are working, people like you, people like me, people like in all these organizations that understand that we're losing something, some, a lot of things that are precious. Our birds, our mammals, you know, all these things, we have a wonderful heritage that we need to work out. And I know you know that, but there's a lot more people than us and they're all over the state. And that was a very hopeful and optimistic thing. And I wanted to pass that along because we know that if you go out and plant a plant, any kind, that it's gonna help some kind of bird, right? But do we want just any kind of plant helping any kind of bird? Do we wanna have the birds like they have at HEB? Yeah. Okay, we have two species that predominate, you know, the, the great tail grackle and the, the house sparrow. And they're both great birds. They're both, in, you know, they have their place. But I would like to have a little more diversity. And Texas is a very diverse state for birds. There's 10,824 species of birds by last count. And we have about a thousand of them in North America. In Texas, 670. 
of those thousand have been recorded, either passing through or they stay here. That's why we're number two, California, they record all that stuff over the ocean, you know? So anyway, we have lots of birds and we are right up there with the best of them. And we are the central of the central flyway. We've got a big heritage that we uh, take care of. So the best way to take care of them is give them the right plants. You know, we have the soil here, you know, <clears throat> we know I've got about a quarter inch soil. We live up on the limestone. Tom has to get a digging stick. He said, we can only have a one gallon pot of anything. Don't get anything bigger. And uh, we, we know how hard it is to grow something, but it's not hard to grow natives. Okay. And when you grow natives, what happens? You get all these native birds. And I think a lot of people discovered that uh, during the lockdown. People looked at birds that had never, never didn't know a bird existed in their backyard. And all of a sudden they're seeing these birds and they're calling the Audubon Society and say, what is that? Well, we taught a lot of how to bird classes. A lot of people discovered birds. Well, we know they're there already. And so what I'd like to do, I can get this thing to work, is just to give you a few things about why birds matter in Texas, okay? Especially in Texas. They matter everywhere, all over the planet because they're part of our ecosystem. Now we all, uh, does anybody here, I don't, I don't wanna see a show of hands if you don't like birds, but most people do like them, okay? They think they're beautiful. If you've seen a painted bunting, if you can see that and not go, ooh, you need some counseling and we'll help you, okay? We love to hear them sing. Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring and it scared the pants off of us because of spring without bird song? Oh my gosh, what would that be like? Or going outside and not hearing your Carolina wren on your back porch building a nest in your shoes, that kind of thing. Okay, and they also have great symbolic. Every culture, there's a bird that has great symbolic meaning. We have a national bird, you know, the bald eagle. I think sometimes they have a comb over, you know. But anyway, uh, we every state has a state bird. Almost every country has a national bird. All right, so why we like that? Because we wanna to fly too. We wanna to be like the birds. We wanna soar, right? They have, we give them all kinds. Owls have all, you know, both negative and positive, but we've got symbolism, poetry about birds. People like them. Now, people also like money. And economically, birds are very, very, very important in Texas. They, we spend like $30 billion every year on bird seed, bird feeders, all those little things to put in your uh, yard to make the birds come. Okay, if there's a bird out there, there's a hummingbird. I saw him a few minutes ago feeding on those tubular flowers. Yeah, if there's a bird, I don't get, I know, never try to never try to beat a bird. But we do all that stuff. We buy those little feeders, we make the, the food and they come to our yard and then we go watch them. Uh, the bird watchers, even if it's just from your window, and they spend money on binoculars and travel. And, you know, people come from all over the world to Texas to see our birds. And we take their money and say, thank you very much. You know, all the way, all over the United States, uh, you, you say birding in the United States and people say Texas. Okay. So, and then hunting is still a big component of our culture here. And it puts a lot of money into bird conservation. And it's like $4 billion a year. So the economic uh, value, if we have to put a number on it, of uh, birds, it's not chicken feed. It's a lot of money, okay? Now we also, we know that they're ecologically very important. They are, uh, they help us with rodent control. Farmers know you don't have to put out that nasty stuff that kills all the raptors to get you, kill the rodents. You just put a couple of barn owl boxes out and they'll take care of it for you. You can, uh, if you need uh, insect control, put some bluebird boxes up, let the chickadees nest in your dead trees and they will take care of your caterpillar problem. You know, they, they will do that. And if pollinators, we know that the hummingbirds are pollinators and they're also birds are seed dispersers. And the difference between birds and rodents is the birds don't chew them up because they don't have any teeth. So the seeds go right through the bird and they're deposited with fertilizer already there and you've seen uh, the hackberries along the, the fence row, birds planted them all, 
right? And so all of this stuff is important ecologically and they don't pollute the planet and they don't charge us for that service, right? Um, scientifically, birds are very important. They gave us the principles of flight. We finally figured out that it was the principle we could copy. We couldn't fly with feathers like they could, but we figured it out. We also found out that we are one planet. Birds don't read maps or, the, or, or, or pay attention to them. They just fly wherever they wanna go and they don't look at borders. We're knitted together. The whole planet is knitted together. There are birds that fly from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back like it's nothing. And we also found out that birds are good bioindicators. They tell us, you've probably heard the, the, the phrase, the uh, canary in the coal mine in the old days, they didn't have any instruments to tell whether the air was bad. So they took a little bird in there because birds have faster metabolism and it affects them faster. So when the bird fell out of the perch, the miner, I hope he grabbed the bird and took off, but he took off after the mine, out of the mine because the, the air was bad. Now birds are falling off their perches all over the world. We live in the same coal mine, y'all. And so we had better pay attention to what they're telling us because that's kind of an omen. We better, better listen up. So in Texas, all of this is in spades because we're a big bird state. We're right smack in the middle of the central plot flyway. We have lots of birds and they're very important in all of these aspects. So, they are important, I think everybody will agree with that. And they're in trouble. They need our help. And you guys are some of the best helpers there are, uh, native plant people. And why do they need it? Well, this, this came out in 2019 and just scared everybody. It was in Science, uh, the big science magazine. Cornell did a study and the last 50 years, and I know I was alive the last 50 years, 2.9 billion individual birds have disappeared just from North America. And some of them are some of our favorites. When's the last time you saw a metal arc? They used to be everywhere, prairies. Now it's your hard part to find them, okay? And so 3 billion birds, that's one about out of about like every four birds in North America. We can't let this trend continue. We just can't. We would lose such sassy little fellas as our, our state bird, not afraid of much, spit in your eye, uh, the good old mockingbird, and uh, the state bird. And then, I don't know which way to point this thing. I love, I, of course, Rowdy the Roadrunner is the um, mascot of UTSA because roadrunners just have an attitude, you know, <laughs> and they're, they're just awesome. And uh, so that's their mascot. And everybody who's ever been around a roadrunner believes in velociraptors because that's what they, that's because that's what they, they kind of act like. They'll eat anything that doesn't eat them first. Okay, great birds. And of course the HEB bird, the, the big great tail grackle. I mean, really, if you went to an HEB in the hill country and you didn't see a grackle, wouldn't you miss it? Or Walmart or any of those big box stores. Uh, Maybe if you park your car in the wrong place, you wouldn't miss it, but uh, they're really part of us. They're, they're part of our hill country heritage. Huh? They are species. What? Grackles? Grackles, they flew into the Walmart and it costs $2,500 to get it Wow, well, all birds are endangered <laughs> to some extent. This is survival by degrees. This was a, a travel, uh, a report put out by National Audubon, also 2019. And all those little birds popping up in the picture there uh, are some of the birds that we love the most. And they say, look, the, the 80, what is it? The 800 pound gorilla in the room is climate change. And as, as the uh, climate continues to warm, birds are gonna have to move and they may not find a place to move to. If you live on a mountain, there's only so high up you can go. And you may try to move and there's no more habitat because somebody's already there, you know? So this is something that we're looking at globally and uh, we, we're, we're working on that. Now, here's the other thing. This is housing density. Look at this, the, I'm not gonna go over there and this doesn't work on there, but you see the trend line <laughs> and that's not gonna change. Our population's booming and you see all those big red dots. I, I think they look kind of like zits on the, the, the map. But those are all concentrations of population. 
and they're all growing together into these big metroplexes. You know, think of Austin, San Antonio, and all those, they're just growing together. It's like an amoeba, you know, and especially along the coastal regions where there's lots of birds. So this is something, and every, uh, all that conversion of bird habitat into living space is taking away habitat for the birds. So the habitat is being removed, degraded, and fragmented. And so this is not as good for the birds. Uh, in Texas, the four in the blue up there were San Antonio, Austin, Houston, and Dallas. This was back in 2015. Those are some of the fastest growing cities in Texas. I don't think anybody needs to see that. I don't believe that, but look here, this is Texas. There's El Paso, there's the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, I just saw a slide today that showed the conversion of agriculture to living space. Everybody's moving down to the valley. Okay, so all of this is affecting birds. And Texas keeps getting bigger. Some of the biggest, uh, fastest growing counties, Travis, Dallas, Bear County, Tarrant County, Harris County, they're all in Texas. Nope. Comal, Comal County? No, not not the fastest. This but you're not pure population change. Not percentage. What? I'm sorry. This is pure population change. Just population. Just population. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's what's happening. We all know that. Now, if you look at just habitat, this is different kinds of habitats. Uh, how many birds are in each one? Like forest and boreal forest and grassland. This was in night in in uh, from 1970. Now look what happened to the populations in 2017. Everyone constricted except one. Wetlands got bigger. Raptors did all right too. Why? We had a cons concerted conservation um, ethic by a duck stamp. Duck, duck hunters want to have ducks for their grandchildren. You know, so they've done the, help the, the um, habitat uh, keep robust and uh, the rest of it, the grasslands are going phew, what, you know, people look at a grassland and they say, well, there's nothing there anyway. I'll just go put up, put up. There's nothing there anyway. That's a big habitat for a lot of different birds. And so we're losing. So that's what I wanted to, I, first I wanna tell you the bad news and then I'm gonna tell you the good news, okay? So this is our hill country. Look at that, that's gorgeous, isn't it? Why did you come to the hill country in the first place? Nobody made you a bet. You came here because you wanted to be here. All right, and these, this is the kind of things that draw us. And so this is what we're trying to um, preserve to some extent. Now we know we have to develop, you know, some and the growth and all that, but we've got to strike a balance. And when we do it, we're gonna help the birds and, and a lot of other critters that live with the birds, the ecosystems. Come on, come on, there we go. Now, I wanna show you a picture that this just rocked my world. This is my house. I'm gonna step around here. I live on Goldfinch Trail. I wasn't a birder when we bought the house, but there we go. And this is what our lush habitat around our house looks like. Now, this was in 1998, something like that. We moved in in 99. Move forward. Those are all my new neighbors. Look at the density of housing. Look what happened to the habitat. Now our house is still in the same place and our neighborhood has got bigger lots and people do have a little more vegetation and we have some oak trees and stuff like that. But if I walk around my neighborhood and I've done this, I can't find any native plants. Guys, got a big job to do. I wanna knock on every door and give them a brochure on native plants. And if I get a chance to talk to neighbors, I do talk to them about that especially lazy gardeners like me, please you know, tell them how good native plants are. And if you go, uh, wanna help the birds, Cornell put this out and it says, make your window safe, um, keep cats indoors, use native plants, avoid pesticides, drink shade grown coffee, reduce plastic use and be a, a community scientist. Well, those are seven things you can do. There's other things you can do. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that one, but. Keep in mind, you can't just do one thing. We have to, we have to work on it kind of all together, but let's start with the most important. What do they eat? Where do they nest? Where do they roost? They use plants. 
Plants are the only critters that can make their own food, right? We got to have them. They're important, but we got to have the right kind. So research shows, and you may know about this research, small native habitats make a big difference for birds. You don't have to have 50,000 acres in native plants. It, it would be nice. And some places, you know, you do want those fields of blue bonnets and those uh, wonderful reserves that have all those plants. But think about a neighborhood where everybody had half the plants at least in their, in their landscaping were natives. Boy, wouldn't that be a difference? I say if we just have one, that's a big improvement over zero. Okay, so if you, even if you just have a pot plant with a native plant in it, the Carolina wrens will build a nest in it, won't they, right? And so anything that you can do and anything we can convince other people to do is helpful. It can be a great extent. And the first thing we have to do is get out, get over having a lawn. Everybody, yeah, I see the choir nodding. Okay, because it's the biggest cultivated, uh, biggest crop in the United States. And it's 40.5 million acres. I think that's the area of South Dakota. But, you know, it's not the right even kind of grass. It's not native grass. It's turf grass. It was brought in from somewhere else. She does know all this. Okay, and it doesn't happen by itself. You gotta mow it, you gotta water it, you gotta baby it, you gotta fertilize it. You put, oh my God, my mother used to work on ours in Houston. The chinch bugs would get them, you know, and then she'd out there with the chinch bug stuff and everything. It took a lot of her time and energy and it takes a lot of water. It takes a lot of chemicals that all get into our water. So we don't need this. I just saw this cartoon and I don't think it's that funny. It says, hear that, the first lawnmower of spring. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be out birding or doing something else than mowing my lawn. Let's convert to native plants and then we don't have to do as much as that. Now, this is what most of the new subdivisions look like if it's that green. High density, very little um, greenery and the greenery is there that's not, is mainly not native. And if you look at a housing, a new one, housing subdivision, this is what you see. They scrape it down to nothing. They put some kind of turf grass in. They put some kind of non-native base plantings. They put a tree that looks like a spindly. And that's what, now imagine you're a bird flying over that. It's like a bad neighborhood. There's nothing to eat. There's, it's not, doesn't look safe. There's no place to hide. Okay, this does not look very friendly to a bird. Okay, but what we do with native plants is we make it more bird friendly by giving them the kind of plants they need, the kind of plants they grew up with. Have you ever gone home to visit your family and they cook the stuff that you grew up with? And even though, you know, maybe it had a little bit too much sugar or too much fat, but it sure tastes good, right? Well, the stuff that the, the birds grew up with uh, is they've, they've co-adapted. And so what we want to do with native plants, ah, come on, is turn suburbia into suburbia. I love that line. I wish it was mine. I stole it. There's a guy who wrote a book about that. And uh, it's, it's very good because he says, you don't have to do your whole landscaping. Just put something native in it. And it'll, you know, get the birds uh, better. And of course the bugs. And this is, these are from San Antonio. These are native plant landscapings in San Antonio. Now, if you're a bird flying over that, whoa, you get the big time. You've got a lovely place to hide. You've got a place to eat. You have a place to sing where there's no lawnmowers drowning you out. And this is the new nature. We can't make enough state parks and national parks and other kind of parks to do the job. We all have to do our part. And you guys are already doing it. But what we need to do, all of us, is to get out and talk to the people who aren't doing it. Show them those demo gardens that are just gorgeous. Show them how well we go there when we feel like it. We don't have to go every week. Wow, that's music to my ears, okay? So we need to get that word out loud and clear that there's a better way and it helps everything. 
Now, this is what you get. These are all native birds. You have a black crested titmouse, and of course the Northern Cardinal and the state bird, the uh, Northern Mockingbird and the lesser goldfinch. Those are all sitting on native plants, Central Texas native plants. Okay. And uh, we know in Audubon that where people nurture native plants, the birds thrive. Not just any birds, not just grackles and house sparrows, but a, a wide diversity of birds that you wanna see. And then you say, oh, and they come through on migration, they stop in your yard because they see good things down there. They don't fly over it <laughs> and go somewhere else. Okay, we also know in Audubon is where birds thrive, people prosper. Well, why is that? What do you need when you travel? Food, water, shelter that's safe. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we need the same things. So if we're helping the birds doing it, it makes our lives better as well. Okay. Now, to do this, you gotta learn to think like a bird. And uh, we all know, I love that picture. I, I found that on the internet. I just thought that was so cute. Uh, birds see the world differently than we do, you know, but um, they don't see it totally different because they need the same things we do. Shelter, which is a, a place to roost and a place to nest, food that really nourishes them. It gives them not empty calories, you know, that we can eat, we can all eat just anything we want, but is that the best thing for us to do? You know, we know the difference. And of course, some water. And in a hot, dry climate like we have here, sometimes water is the most important of those three at any particular time. So if you think like a bird and you look at your property, and this is what we get people to do, look at your property and if you were a bird, what would you find to eat there? Where would, you sh where would you shelter? Where would you find water? And the sad answer to that a lot of times is nowhere. There's nothing there. And if they, they go next door and they go next door and they go next door and they don't find it. So we need more density of native plants. Native plants rule the world. Okay. And so we show people how to take an inventory of what they already have. You know, some people don't know a native plant. They call it a weed. I hate that word. A weed's a plant that's good attributes have just not been discovered yet. And they'll dig it up. We dug up a couple of things in our yard before we got not uh, trained in master naturalists and of course with the native plant society and so forth and then we let them grow and we said dang that thing grows like a weed but it isn't a weed it's a beautiful plant if you let it go and you don't have to do anything to it it just does it all by itself you know so we try to see get people to see the beauty of the native and also uh get rid of the stuff that didn't you know minimize it and minimize the amount of turf grass that they have and you know, all those things that you guys are doing, all right? So this all helps the birds. Look at here, layers are important to birds. Some birds feed at the top, some feed in, the, in a brush, some feed on the ground. So if you have the layers, you've got a better bird habitat, okay? If you've got diversity of plants, the more diversity of plants, the more diversity of birds that you'll have. Just like when you put out feeders, put out one kind of seed, you get a couple kind of birds, put out five different kinds of seed and a hummingbird feeder, you get a lot of bunch of, of different birds. And of course the mulching and all the things that we do, putting some rocks, little crevices, the birds will use all of those. And so think like a bird, where would you go if you were a little wren to hide? You know. Okay, now the other thing, we're very neat. This is German country, I'm German by ancestry. And we have to have it neat, you know. Well, neat is not nature, nature is not neat. But we also have to you know, consider our neighbors. We do not want the vacant lot look. We want a managed native plant garden, right? So that people want to have it next door to them, okay? But you always have a little corner in your yard you can leave a brush pile. And that will give shelter to small birds during the winter. It'll give shelter to small rodents and that shelter also to uh, butterflies that are overwintering. They're really good. Put them where nobody can see them but you. You know, and then if you've got a dead tree, if it's not gonna be too close to, on your house, leave it. Because a lot of birds will use it for nesting and a lot of birds will use it to find food because there's bugs in there and they'll dig them out. 
So if you have a non-native tree you want to get rid of, girdle it, let it die in place. And if you can't stand to see a stump, plant a trumpet vine on it. You know, if you got to have meat, make it flowers, you know, but all of those are helpful to birds, okay, and bugs. And of course, we know the nice plants, the natives instead of common exotics, that's wonderful. And uh, if you, if somebody told me this and I thought it was a good advice, that if you have plants in your yard that don't have bug bites, you got the wrong plants because the native insects will only eat the native plants almost all the time. They'd rather starve than eat exotics. I think my mother would have rather starved than eat Chinese food. And she just wouldn't, didn't, didn't cotton to that, you know. But uh, these things is because of they've adapted so many hundreds and millions of years together that that's the relationship. So a good uh, bird friendly native plants and you guys have lists of them. Joel sent me a research source list that long. <laughs> it's wonderful, that's a great resource. You guys have all the resources. You know what plants will work here. So we need to just get the word out better. That's, that's, your, that's your mission, isn't it? Isn't it? I think so, yeah. Okay, I'm glad. And let me just tell you a couple of things about plants for birds. These are all natives and the size of the fruit, look at the size of the fruit of a native plant, kind of tiny, right? Little, well, a, a fruit about three fifths of an inch is just perfect for a bird to eat whole. You know, birds don't have teeth. They can't chew up stuff, except the raptors and they eat meat. So they swallow it, they digest the good stuff. And what comes out the end of the bird? Guano, right? And it has the seeds in it and they're already softened and they're ready to sprout. In fact, some plants like the um, hackberry, you, they won't even sprout until they've gone through the digestive system of an animal. And birds are the number one that uh, mockingbirds eat a lot of those. So there's the uh, native persimmon, the uh, possum haw, the juniper berries, the chili pekin, which that, ugh, they like it spicy, even the, the um, mistletoe. All of those are size that are just perfect for our native birds to, to eat and to disperse the seeds, if you'd like to, a nice way to say that. And a lot of these uh, plants give a lot of sugar and, and fat. And that, what does that do? It fuels migration. Birds have to have a lot of fuel to get, think of yourself uh, from flying from Brazil to Canada on little wings like that big. You got to have a lot of fuel and these high, high fat and high sugar berries and stuff like that of native plants have that nutrition. And of course the, the cedar waxwings love it because they get snockered every spring when the, they get uh, fermenting and they eat the berries and they fly into things, you know, it's like, hey, we're going to migrate. Woohoo, let's get out of here. So there they go. But they get that, they get the, um, the berries to fuel them. And then, of course, there's the mockingbird eating the hackberry. And the hackberry is a really unappreciated plant. Uh, somebody told me to get rid of my hackberries because they're just trash trees. I, I said that to a naturalist and he said, yeah, I want more trash like that. Because they're one of the number one, of course, number oaks are number one. But hackberries in our area are really good. And they grow all over the place and they grow in soil that won't grow much else, you know. So good. And if you have, uh, like, sunflowers or native grasses, and I know you have all those, let them go to seed and don't knock them down, deadhead them, because all the birds that are wintering here need those seeds, and they'll, they'll take those in preference to the ones you buy uh, any day, and you'll see them. And of course, the birds that hide acorns and other kind of seeds, they're planting the next generation, right? They don't remember them all. They have good memory, but not perfect. So uh, all of those things are important to birds as well as propagating your native plants. Okay, and we know that anything you do on your yard with natives, you don't really need to put much junk on them, right? Uh, fertilizer or um, pesticides or anything, because a good native gardener is, is a bug-friendly gardener, right? We don't go, ew, caterpillar. Now we say, oh, look. What kind of, what does that make? You know, we learn to appreciate those creepy crawlies. Now, 
even birds that are, we consider seed eaters like cardinals and stuff. When they're feeding their babies, they're feeding them lots of caterpillars and other insects because they're full of fat and protein makes the babies grow really fast. Okay, they want an empty nest quick because a nest is a very dangerous place for the baby bird. And so we see all of these birds eating insects, whether, whether they uh, eat them all the time or just mainly in the, in the breeding season. This is the golden cheek warbler, which we know is an endangered species. And it, where we survey them up in San Antonio, you see those giant caterpillars they get and they stuff them down those little mouths. And you can watch the little dudes grow. They grow so fast. And then the, the hummingbirds, we think of them as nectar feeders, which they are, but they also eat, especially during breeding season, the female eats lots of gnats and she makes a smoothie, mixes it with the ne nectar and the gnats, a gnat nectar smoothie and pumps it into those little babies and you can watch them grow. And the nest is made out of spider silk so it can stretch as they grow. And so all of these are important. And if we go about, taking out all of our ball moss, because it's so ugly. There's many, 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 many caterpillars and tiny ones. Let the chickadees have them. Look at here. It takes six to thousand to 9,000 caterpillars to raise a single clutch of four to six chickadee babies. And they don't, they don't have to be big ones. I mean, caterpillars, different sizes. And they come, they're gonna feed right near their nest. So if you have a chickadee nesting near you, you got caterpillar control. Okay, so yeah, you can give them food for the, you know, excess food. This is our lush backyard. Okay, that's what our backyard kind of looks like. And we put up a hummingbird feeder and we put different seeds up so that we can see a bigger variety. And we leave them up most of the, most of the year, but you know what? The birds take it like this. If there's plenty of native plant food out, they don't come to our feeders. They come to our feeders when there's nothing left. You know, it's kind of like eating some things that we eat. You don't have time for a real food, so you just pick up something that's probably not very good for you. Well, our food is good for them, but it probably is not as good as native. And when you get them close, you can really study them and you don't scare them. And they're sitting there eating this lesser goldfinch and American goldfinch. We had both on our uh, Niger feeders, but you see them when they decide that they don't have enough other stuff to eat. And of course, clean water because we're not polluting the water with all that pesticide and all that stuff, the water that gets down to the coast is clean. And this is the poster child, the whooping crane, we're down to 14 birds back in the 1940s, up to about almost 600 now. But if we starve the coast of fresh water, the estuaries get too salty, the blue crabs don't do well, and this thing doesn't get enough to eat. We lost 27 of them in one year during a drought. Okay. You spend millions of dollars keeping them on the planet. So you can do wonderful things like this with, or you can just put out a little bottom of a uh, pot plant and put some water in it for, for, the, for the birds. That helps and it helps your plants, of course. And please get a right, the right kind of bird bath. This is too deep and it's in the middle of the yard. Would you like to take a bath in the middle of your yard? <laughs> no. Okay, birds don't like deep water either. They like to be under a tree. That's our bird bath. It's got a little dripper on it and that little drip brings them in. They can hear that water and they come in. Chickadee was upside down on ours right before we left, drinking right out of the spot. She liked that fresh water. And put a rock in it. If it's too deep, just put a couple of rocks in it, put it under a tree so they can fly up. If a hawk gets after them, they can just fly away. So that's no good, this is better. All right, then um, <clears throat> I love cats, I really do, but uh, they stay, need to stay away from birds. So if you have all the beautiful plants in your yard and your neighbor has a cat and they come over and eat the birds, talk to your neighbor, talk to them nicely. And I've got some brochures over here. Their cat's in danger when it's outside. The coyotes eat them, the cars hit them, they get diseases. Uh, the veterinarians will tell you that, that cats indoors are much safer. And of course the birds are safer as well. Okay, now I wanna know what happened here. <laughs> Who won that one? That'd be kind of a thing. Yeah, and some people these days who really love their kitties and they really have the resources to do so, they make a catio. 
and they build a, a, a cat uh, enclosure on their patio. It's called a catio. The, the cat watches the birds and the birds watch the cat and they're both safe. Isn't that something? And you don't have the cat box in your house. If you have birds hitting your window, if you hear that terrible thud and you see a dead bird, please do something about your window. Now birds can see ultraviolet. You see what they see? They can see ultraviolet. We can't, that's what we see on the left. But those stickers, they don't work as well because you need to have more of a grid on the outside, there's lots of different products. American Bird Conservancy can furnish you with about 50 different products, but we have to use them. Bird strikes kill up to a billion birds every year. And most of them are on houses, small buildings, not high rises. So if you hear that sound, please do something about it. We've got some uh, brochures here. Light, turn your lights out at night during migration. Most birds migrate at night. and uh, if they the navigating, it messes them up, their navigation, they come down too low and then they run into buildings. So between uh, March 1st and June 15th, August 15th and November 30th, if you've got unnecessary outside lighting, which means any lighting that points up, that stays on all the time, you need a motion sensor or something like that so it goes on and off when it's needed, okay? This will help the birds, okay? So bird-friendly products, you know, all this kind of stuff. Just say no to plastics. Uh, there's pictures of albatrosses feeding their babies cigarette lighters that they found on the beach made out of plastic. It kills them. So any, and it's getting into our food and our water, microplastics. Uh, there's a person at UTSA right now doing a study on caracaras. How many microplastics are found in the pellets that they regurgitate, a lot, okay? So the less plastic we use, and a lot of that plastic doesn't get recycled properly or cannot be recycled. So if we can find an alternative, let's use it. And if you drink coffee, try to shade grown coffee. Uh, coffee is a, is a plant, always grew like this in the shade under the big trees where the birds roost, humans, created coffee that would grow in the sun so they could make big fields of it. And they cut down the rainforest. And our birds that come up here, the warblers especially, they come up here to nest, but they go down there for the winter, our winter, and they need a place to live. So if we drink coffee, we can buy, it's very good for you, it's low acid. Rudamaya, get it at Costco, H-E-B, grown in Mexico, roasted in Austin. So the best of our, our area right there. And there's other brands, but be sure it says bird-friendly shade-grown coffee, and that'll help. There's also shade-grown chocolate and other things that thinking like a bird. Okay, now, so it all comes down to a mindful lifestyle. Plants are part of it. They're a very important part of it, but it's not the only thing, okay? And so look what you get. This is the reward right here. You get, can you imagine looking out your back window and you've got a painted bunting in your, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Or you, you know, just that little hummingbird flitting around here, that was just great. Or you look up and the chickadee comes out of a hole in an old dead tree and you go up there and there's six, eight babies in there. You think, how does that little bird feed all those? She's eating all your caterpillars. That's what. And then you get to brag and, and show everybody how, how beautiful it is. And then they'll say, how did you do that? You say, well, let me tell you about native plants. Let me tell you about all this stuff. And you can spread this word, this good word that helps not only the birds, but the, all the insects, the other pollinators, and it helps us, helps us have a cleaner, better thing. And if you, if you like looking at the birds and, and you, know, you say, I'd like to learn more about them, we can help you with that. We can teach you a bird skills workshop so you can know their names. There's a lot of tools on your phone that can help you these days. Um, so Audubon is about bird friendly gardening and we go out, I, I speak to a lot of garden clubs. They talk a lot about roses and daylilies. So how about native plants? Oh, well, you know, okay, there's your perfect, you guys need to work on a lot of those garden clubs. 
Um, and we give them this bird friendly checklist and we try to talk to them, but we have more people talking and showing them the result of how beautiful it can be and how little maintenance, sometimes it'll sink in. Okay, and then Audubon has a native plant database. And what's nice about this, of course you can get a sign too to put in your yard. It says, you know, I did this on purpose. I did this for sure. Uh, but the thing I like about it, let's suppose you have, you came here from somewhere else and, and somebody says, wow, you've got a great yard, you use these natives. But I live in Ohio or Michigan or whatever. What plants do I use? Well, you can send them to their native plant society. I'm sure they have them. But online, we have a native plant database and you put your email address and your zip code. And it runs out a list of plants that will grow in that area. And it tells you what birds and butterflies it will benefit. So that's a good way to contact people who aren't right in the, your area. Lots of books out there and Joel's got a lot of them on his resource list. Uh, Audubon Society Guide to Attracting Birds, 101 Ways to Help Birds. This is in general, just like I've mentioned. And of course, Doug Ptolemy is the, the high priest of this and uh, he wrote Bringing Nature Home and it changed all of our perspective. He is a wonderful person. I've had several conversations with him and I worship at his shrine. He's got, he's on the right track, okay? And uh, this is a required reading. And he said this, for the first time in its history, gardening has taken on a role that transcends the needs of the gardener. Like it or not, gardeners have become important players in the management of our nation's wildlife. It's now within the power of individual gardeners to do something that we all dream of doing to make a difference. In this case, the difference will be to the future of biodiversity, to the native plants and animals of North America and the ecosystems that sustain them. And I might add, sustain us. So this is both a wonderful feeling that I have that power, I'm empowered but it's also a responsibility that we all have. So he wrote that and you can bring your nature home and that's what he's talking about and then be nature's best hope. And the second book I kind of like is, I don't know. I, I just think there one, he's got one out now about oak trees and the value of oak trees. Um, Doug Ptolemy is gonna talk to our Audubon Society via Zoom in November and you are all invited now we are charging a $5 ticket fee because we have to pay him. Uh, November 3rd, uh, I'll have all the details uh, probably by the end of the summer, the Zoom link and all that, how to get a ticket on Ticket Leap and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and we invite you all to come because I don't care how many times I hear him, I am always inspired and he's gonna come and he won't travel much anymore. He says, I'll come and for this much, but if I have to come to Texas, it'll be three times as much. I said, well, there's a no brainer if I ever heard it. And so he's gonna be on Zoom and he's great. So please put that on your calendar, November 3rd. Delaware. Yeah, he's in Delaware. That's where he's, he's a, uh, 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 he's an entomologist. He's an entomologist. Okay, now almost done here. This is the thing that I love. It says, if you take care of the birds, you take care of most of the environmental problems in the world. That's kind of cool. So the best way to take care of birds is the plants. We know that. And we know you're all trying really hard to do that. And we appreciate everything you do for the birds. And I hope you appreciate what the birds do for your gardens, because it is a reciprocal relationship. You know, and I've got some brochures up here about things like turning out your lights and keeping cats. If you have a neighbor who has a cat, I had a neighbor who had two cats. And she says, oh, but my cats all have to go outside. At night. I said, well, it's kind of dangerous. We have, you know, coyotes and stuff. Well, she, they, they, the, the one she had left became an indoor cat the day the other one didn't come home. Okay, so this is a really good positive brochure about making your beloved cat safe, okay? So please avail yourself. The other one I wanna mention really quickly, there's plans for birds, there's lights out. But if any of you are interested in birds at all, we are your Audubon. 
We may be called Bear Audubon, but we cover nine counties and Comal is one of them. All the counties that touch Bear County plus Kerr because they were pouting because they didn't have an Audubon. Okay. <laughs> so we are your Audubon. And if you have, uh, you want to co contact us, there's, we have a website. You're welcome to all of our meetings. If anything's of interest to you, um, our meetings are free. The fourth Wednesday of every month. And uh, please take one of these and, and contact us. And we are happy to answer questions. If we can't find out, we'll find out somebody that can answer. Okay. So thanks for nurturing this relationship. And I hope that what I've done is to make it abundantly clear that it's an important relationship and the rewards are many for going both ways on this relationship. So I thank you for uh, inviting us and all the things that you do. And at this point, I would like if anyone, I, I can go into the chat and see if anybody's put a question and you have a question. Yes, I'll I, repeat I it. I mainly had a comment. Okay. To let everyone know about the colonies new project, the uh, Homegrown National Park. Yep. They have planned to decide to join as a partner. Uh, it's a really cool program. I encourage you to all look it up online. It's, uh, it's, it's called the Homegrown. National I will repeat Park. it on here. Yeah, Homegrown National Park. That's his new project because he said we can make the United States of America a homegrown of one great big national park. Doing what? Using native plants. So we're partners with that too. Yes. Yes, Susan. Uh, two things. First off, the library is all free. Books. Yes. You can check them out. Them. Also, the Butterfly Garden is a first homegrown national park. Okay, I want to I want to repeat that. You don't have to buy Doug Ptolemy's books. I had to because I just write all over them and put stickies on them and stuff. But they're available in almost every library here in Comel County. And the Butterfly Garden is the first homegrown national park. Registered in, 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 registered in Comal County. Congratulations. Yeah. Very great. Thank you. Yes. How about giving the Bear Audubon to take up a little collection to send Calvin Finch and Neil Sperry to Siberia <laughs> one way trip? <laughs> Who? Yeah. <laughs> Neither one of them, you know, it's like one out of every 50 they might mention a native plant. Yeah. of their column yeah. and pesticides for everything yeah. and it's like if we could just get them a one-way ticket to Siberia well we do a lot better with doing native plants okay so uh I don't know if I gotta I'm gonna say all that again <laughs> but uh yes just because they have a newspaper column or a radio show we had a lot of bad advice from somebody who had a newspaper column and a radio show and they did not steer us so all People who say they are experts are mainly has-beens who are drips under pressure. I'm sorry, but, or they could be. So always check it out and you have the best resource, your resource sheet that you have. Read up, educate yourself. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we talk about caterpillars. Yes, yeah, there's birds that eat those, yeah. Okay, how do you attract more of them? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, those that's a good question because some years they almost defoliate our mountain lawyer, but they have grown up together and they never eat at all. Now they may eat a, maybe one or two plants down to nothing. But they eat all the new green. Yeah, they eat all the new green. But they have they've reached a truce because if they eat at all, then they won't have any next year. So there is a balance there. Okay. Uh, sometimes it gets a little skewed one way or the other. Uh, well, I will tell you, you know, those tent caterpillars, they're supposed to be the nastiest tasting. And I think the ones on the uh, laurel are probably not too tasty. I don't know. I don't eat caterpillars, but um, <laughs> cuckoos, when they come in here in the summer, they eat the, the worst caterpillars of any bird. And I wouldn't be surprised that they're not here, though, early when the laurels bloom. But there's probably a bird that does. I can't tell you which one it is. I'm sorry. I'll do a little research so and find out. <laughs> I understand. I understand. I like that great Kool-Aid. Did you have a somebody? I thought I yeah. 
But um, I'm wondering, like, um, I have a ton of feral cats in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Like, is there anything you can do about that? I mean, I do have a very, it seems like a very strong bird population in my yard and stuff, but, but cats are everywhere. They're not yeah. Well, I know, uh, I know some people who have a similar situation and they barricaded their yard. They put, uh, they have a fence and, you know, they have these things, I kind of remember not to leave. Okay. Uh, they have these um, things that you can keep your cat in the yard. You put it on the top of your fence and the cat won't jump over it because they can't get out. You can put them out backwards and keep the cats from jumping in your yard, but then you have to have a fence. And um, it's a big problem. It's a, it's a terrible problem that we have. And San Antonio is one of the worst cities for it. And we're working on it, but it's a long road. We're working on cat owners first because they love their cats. And um, I, wish, I wish I had a magic wand and could start. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So just protect your birds. Uh, if you have to put something up to protect the birds from the cats, if you can. If not, take your feeders down. And that's, that's hard for me to say because I love that so much. You know. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I disagree with a little bit of your, you live in a, a community of having your yards prettied up a little bit. Because I've left my four and a half acres are pretty much completely natural, except right around the house. Yeah. Oh, I didn't mean that. No, the, the question was, do you have to pretty up the yard? No, I'm not. I didn't mean that. What I meant was you don't want it to look like completely un. Uh, yeah, OK, you have four acres. I have one acre and I have a neighbor on either side. And if I let my yard get too uh, unruly. Now, my backyard is totally unruly, but they can't see it. But the front yard, we keep a little bit more. Uh, civilized for the uh, neighbors. Uh, it's not perfect, but you don't have to you know, have it completely perfect, but uh, you just and have they, to- These pictures were designed more to try to calm somebody into giving negative things. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's exactly, yeah, somebody. yeah. It's a problem with HOAs. You know, too. Yes. Places, HOAs, where you're more than well, HOAs are elected. Yeah. <laughs> HOA, get on the HOA board. And be the native plant person on that board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, one more, and then we're going to have to quit because we're going to get run out of here. That's okay. All right. Go ahead. I um, I got behind the morning my yard, and I have four grass. Yeah. 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 It depends on the type of grass. If you've got native grasses, they make native seeds, and the birds will uh, will use them. In favor of even seed that we buy and, and feed them. Well, I don't even know what that grass is. Well, I bet you somebody in here does, <laughs> and they can advise you, and you can actually uh, in you know do plots. The question was, is grass good for birds? Yeah, there's a lot of birds that eat nothing but grass seed. In fact, our beautiful lark sparrow that has the harlequin face, they're one of the truly vegetarian birds. They never eat insects, hardly, unless it's on a piece of grass or seed, um, not on purpose maybe, but uh, a lot of birds eat those. So yeah, get some of these people to help you and, and maybe start removing some of the non-native grasses and replacing them a bit at a time. Yeah. Okay, well, we're gonna uh, follow the, the timeline. Any questions online? Yeah, that was my next question, Tom. Thank you. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much, people online. I hope I can, you can see me. And thank you all. Appreciate it. Uh, Easter, have tons of old meetings and we just throw them away. Okay.